One of the problems with recruiting for investment banking is not the knowledge or skills you acquire, but the access to talk with real investment bankers to put your best foot forward. Our sponsor, WSO Academy, can provide those connections with 60 head mentors who are finance professionals at top firms like Goldman, Centerview, and JP Morgan. Imagine being able to get on the phone within 24 hours with one of the Academy's 1,300 mentors right before a critical interview. Get on the waitlist for WSO Academy today by clicking the link in the show notes or by visiting wallstreetoasis.com slash academy. All right, all right, all right. Welcome to Investment Banking Insights, the only podcast dedicated to helping you learn both the technical and non-technical aspects of the investment banking process. Hello, my name is Alex Mason and I am your host and I am so grateful that you're here listening to me as I go through all these technical questions and I'm an incoming MBA student, career switcher, trying to learn these things along with you and I'm going to try to break these concepts down as well as I can for you. And I'm excited because today we're starting a new topic. We're starting a new topic that we haven't covered before on the show. And we're already past 100 episodes. And this is something that we haven't really touched on yet. But now it's finally time to get into mergers and acquisitions. Yes, mergers and acquisitions. We're going to talk all about the basics. What is a merger and an acquisition? What are the steps? What are the different components? What do you have to look for? And yeah, this is the bread and butter of a lot of what investment bankers do, especially in firms that are focused specifically on M&A. There's a lot of other investment banking types of activities, but this is one of the bread and butters, right? Companies buying other companies and yeah, it's just, it's big business and it's all around us. It's constantly happening in the economy today. So Let's get into today's question, which is the very simple question. Walk me through a merger model. Walk me through a merger model. Now, you'll notice this is kind of similar to the fundamental question that we started with in the discounted cash flow section, which was walk me through a DCF. Now, a merger model, what what is it? What is it? It's a financial model, just like a discounted cash flow model is a financial model projecting out the cash flows for a company, a merger model is a financial representation of two companies that are combining to become one company. And it includes the financial profiles of both of the companies, which you would expect, right? But it also comes with some other pieces of information, key pieces of information if you're trying to analyze a deal. So you have the financial profiles of both companies, You have the purchase price. You also have the purchase method. This is also known as consideration. So purchase price, that's pretty self-explanatory. Is it a $500 million deal? Is it a $50 billion deal, right? The consideration or purchase method is how the money is being paid. It may be all cash. It may be all stock. It may be some combination of stock and cash depending on the situation. And we're going to talk about that in future episodes for sure. But those are some key pieces of information. The merger model is also going to include whether or not the buyer's earnings per share increases or decreases. And these are concepts that are known as accretion and dilution. And we're going to get to that also in future episodes too. But just laying out the landscape here, A merger model contains the financial profiles of both companies, the purchase price, the purchase method, as well as whether or not the earnings per share of the buyer increases or decreases. Those are some key pieces there. So that's kind of the layout of what it includes. But how do we get to it? How do we actually walk through a merger model? And I'm going to break this down into six steps, six steps. So step number one, first of all, we have to assume the price of the deal as well as the consideration. This is important. We have to assume, okay, what, what's actually being exchanged here in terms of cash or stock and how much is it? Very simple. Number two, we're going to determine the valuations and the shares outstanding for company number one and project out its income statement post-merger. So we're going to look at company number one in our merger, 
and then figure out, okay, how much is, is this company worth? How much is it worth? What are the shares outstanding? And by shares outstanding, I'm just referring to the amount of stock that exists for the company, right? Because if we were to take our net income, our earnings, and divide it by the shares outstanding, we get something called earnings per share. So it's, it's kind of like your per ownership a cut of the profits of a company. So if you went and bought Apple stock today, you bought one share of Apple, there's a certain amount of earnings per share for Apple stock. And then you as a shareholder in Apple, that's technically your cut of the profits of Apple the corporation. So that's what earnings per share is and why shares outstanding matter here. And then notice that we talked about projecting the income statement post-merger. We want to see after this deal happens how much revenue is there going to be? How much EBITDA is there going to be? How much net earnings is there going to be for the company? So those are important things to know. So that's step number two. Determine the valuations and shares outstanding for the first company and project out its income statement post-merger. Step number three. Very simply, repeat step number two, but for company number two. So we're determining valuations and shares outstanding projecting out the income statement for company number two. Step number four. This is where things get interesting. This is where we combine the income statements for both companies. And we're going to add up the revenue. We're going to add up the expenses and other line items. And in the pre-tax income line, what we're going to do is we have to adjust this number because when the deal happens, there are a couple of things that we have to consider in terms of opportunity costs. We have to adjust for two main things. First is the foregone interest on cash, and second is the interest paid on debt. So think about if you had a company and you wanted to buy another company. Okay, well, that's great. You have a certain cash balance in your company's account, and that cash is probably earning you some interest. Well, if you use that cash to buy the other company, you're going to get the other company's earnings power, but you're giving up the interest that you could have earned on that cash if you still had that cash. You see what I'm saying? So it's the opportunity cost of that. So you're making the adjustments there. Likewise, if you own a company and you have, uh, you have debt, you're paying interest on that debt. But when you combine companies, the entire capital structure of the business changes. So you may have to make adjustments for the interest payments on the debt. So those are two considerations there. Now, let's move on to step number five. You've done all this work. You've combined the income statements for the two companies. You've made adjustments. Now what do you do? You're going to apply the buyer's tax rate in order to get the combined net income. So you combine these income statements and then whoever is buying the company, you have to apply that tax rate in order to get the overall final earnings for the combined entities. In step six, the final step, you take that net income, you divide it by the new share count, the new shares outstanding for the combined company in order to get your combined earnings per share number. Because remember, maybe company number one has a certain amount of shares before the deal. Company number two might have a different amount of shares before the deal. But then depending on how the the deal happens, there's going to be a new amount of shares for the combined entity. And so you take your combined income divided by your combined share count. That gets you earnings per share for the combined entity. That's step six. And just as a quick recap, here are the six steps. Number one. You're going to assume your deal price as well as your consideration. Number two, you're going to determine your valuations and shares outstanding for the first company and project out its income statement post-merger. Step number three is you're going to do the same thing, but for company number two. Step number four is you're going to combine the income statements of both companies and adjust for a few different items like foregone interest on cash as well as interest paid on debt. Number five, you're going to apply the buyer's tax rate to get the combined net income. And then finally, step number six, you're going to divide the combined net income by the new share count in order to get your combined earnings per share. 
So that's how you walk through a merger model, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> a little bit of a longer episode for you, but this is an important concept that I wanted to cover um, with some clarity, with some detail, because I don't know about you, but I'm going to be listening to this episode again for myself. <laughs> so I hope you got some value out of it. This is Alex Mason with Investment Banking Insights. I am your host, and we are on to mergers and acquisitions, my friends. Next episode, we're going to be talking about what the difference is between a merger and an acquisition. Sometimes these terms get used interchangeably, and it's important to know the subtleties. It's important to know the difference. So we're going to be talking about that next. Until then, I'll see you next time.